Thank you, Bruce, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank Brookings and Patel for putting this report together because I've been reporting on environmental issues for four years now. And <coughs> I've written I don't know how many stories about green jobs and clean tech jobs and clean economy jobs. And it's nice to finally have a definition and a, a, a number I can finally show my editors because I think they're always slightly suspicious that uh, this could be almost anything or nothing, really. Uh, but it does show the sheer size of the clean economy. It's much bigger. I think that then we, we often realize, and it's also all around us. Uh, that was very clear from that presentation. It's not just uh, the kind of sexy jobs, the, the, the high-tech shoulder jobs that we tend to write about, uh, but it's mass transit, it's waste management, uh, it's conservation, things like that. And, and that really shows, I think, both uh, that, that these jobs are more normal than we, we think, but also there's a real potential for growth there as well. Um, at the same time, what was sort of touched on at the very end, that last question, I think, about the partisan gridlock that we face now is that um, we are at a very important juncture here uh, now. We, we face a situation where we have a desperate need for high-quality jobs in this country. Uh, we're suffering with 9.2 percent unemployment. Um, and that's on top of the, the, the very pressing energy and climate problems that uh, these, these jobs are, are meant in some ways to, to deal with. And uh, we have to worry about energy, energy security. We have to worry about where we'll stack up in the future, because as, as was clear from before, the United States is very much at risk of falling behind on, on this area. We see countries like Germany, we see countries like China, certainly, uh, taking this much more seriously, uh, investing uh, from the top down in a way that uh, we've had a very hard time, I think, in the United States. I mean, over the last two years, or the last few years, we've certainly uh, seen a lot of investment uh, through the Recovery Act, uh, through what, what we're talking about, what DOE is doing, but at the same time, we face, I think, a concern that there's going to be a cliff, uh, a, a real, uh, if not just a, uh, you know, a down cycle, but potentially a really, a really frightening, uh, you know, cliff that we might be falling off of. Uh, so with this this panel, we're going to really sort of try to get a sense as to where the U.S. is now on the clean economy sector. Uh, we'll be talking to some people who actually produce jobs, actually produce uh, products in in that sector as well. And we want to see where in that environment are we really poised to see growth. Um, we talked a little bit before about the policy challenges here. We'll, we'll go a little bit more into depth there, both talking about what can be done, I think, federally, but also what can be done on the local and metro area where I think we see those green shoots of, of growth really uh, potential, uh, potentially much more perhaps productive than what we might see on the federal level. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk really about the need for, for innovation. We're at a period where I think we need to try something new. Um, we, we can't necessarily continue the old policies of the past especially as the sector grows, as clean energy continues to grow, we're going to see, I think, a limit to how far subsidies can go. Um, we're already beginning to see that actually around the, around the world. You might have seen there was a great uh, piece in Foreign Affairs by David Victor at Stanford about these this concerns about this, this, this not a coming clean tech crash, but certainly a sense that you're going to get squeezed out in the future. So what, what can go forward? What do we uh, invest our, you know, quite honestly, limited funds in to get the most bang for our buck? So, let me start with uh, the introductions for our panelists. To my left here is Dr. Arun Majumdar. He is the first director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency for, the, for Energy, the ARPA-E, which is the country's only agency devoted to transformational energy research and development. He uh, also serves as a senior advis advisor to uh, Secretary Chu, and he was the associate laboratory director for energy and environment at Lawrence Berkeley uh, before he joined that. Uh, to his left, we have Brian Sager, who is the founder and Vice President of Corporate Development for NanoSolar, uh, really one of the most promising uh, solar PV companies out there right now. He manages the company's government programs, strategic partnerships, uh, and the intellectual uh, product property portfolio. To his left, left is Timothy Richards, who is the Managing Director for Energy Policy at the DC office for, for GE. He represents uh, GE on energy policy and really leads a team of GE government policy leaders in DC and around the world. And lastly, we have James Rossman, who is a Managing Director at Lazard's Power, Energy, and, and Infrastructure Group, uh, where he heads the firm's global efforts on alternative energy. So I really want to talk with uh, you first. Um, everyone's very excited about RPE. I love, you know, it's, it's the thing that gets people excited here when I go elsewhere around the world. They really see that as something that's, that's, that's a truly innovative way to, to get at some of these problems. So, Tell me a little bit about what RPE does, what your, what your daily job is like, and, and what kind of purpose it's serving, why we, why we really need it. I'm excited too, by the That's way. That's good. <laughs> uh, first of all, let me just take this opportunity to give my best wishes to Andy Refkin, I think who is uh, ill, fell ill, who was going to be here 
Um, and so my best wishes to him. Thanks to you, Mark, and your team for doing all the heavy lifting for this meeting and the reports, et cetera. Um, believe it or not, this is my second public event for the day, so I'm trying to transform my brain and get into this <laughs> mode now. <clears throat> but RPE was created two years ago um, in the model of DARPA. And it's important to understand the history of DARPA. It was, that was created in 1958 in response to Sputnik when it was felt that the United States was losing its technological lead and there was a vulnerability uh, for the nation. And it went on to create things like the internet and GPS and other uh, wonderful things that you all use today. So no pressure on us. <laughs> You're supposed to do that for the energy field. And you know, I, I believe that we are, and I think a lot of us share this belief that we are in that vulnerable state. Uh, we are importing uh, more than 50% of the oil that we use. We're paying a billion dollars a day. And that's a source of our vulnerability. It's a national security issue. It's an economic growth issue. If you could spend the dollars out here, it would be many more jobs. Um, if you look at the grid, for example, or infrastructure, the average age of the assets on the grid are 42 years, two years more than the lifetime. And that is an issue. So you look across the whole uh, infrastructure that we have and the technologies, um, it, is a, it is a vulnerability. And you know, Secretary Chu has said this very nicely. You know, when the oil, oil prices go up, we hit the panic button. When the oil prices come down, we hit the snooze button. And that's no way to run the United States of America. And so I think this is the, the time to really invest in the future. And while this is a national security issue, by the way, for the United States, it's a national security issue for China, because they're importing oil as well. It's a national security issue for India and other growing economies. So this is a global market for things. And we need to look at it as a way to innovate, to be able to address not only the United States needs, but frankly, the global market, just with, the, with what we did with information technology, with biotechnology, and others. We need to do it for clean energy technologies. And it's a massive market because people are looking for technologies to adopt and to create their own security. So just a few examples. Um, we all know that we are hopefully transitioning a transportation sector, which is a vulnerability, to some element of electrification. So, uh, and that is going on, plug-in hybrid. It's just too expensive. So our way of looking at it in RPE is that let's go for that battery, which does not exist today, by the way, but that battery that will make the electric cars have a longer range and be cheaper than internal combustion engine cars so you can sell without subsidies. Okay? So that battery is, may, need not be a lithium-ion battery. So we are looking at now we've created a program called BEAST, Batteries for Electrical Energy Storage for Transportation. <coughs> Just like you have an Intel inside in your, most of your computers, we hope you have a beast inside in your cars <laughs> in the future. And this market, again, as I said, it's not just the US market, but worldwide. But to make it to that price point, cost is everything. Uh, and you know, so this you know, whole class of metal air batteries, including lithium air, lithium sulfur batteries, these are really hard, challenging problems. And it's the idea of translating science, what we know about chemical reactions and electrochemical reactions, translate into a device, so the first prototype which is pre-venture. And that's the area that, that we are trying to, um, trying to focus on. Um, solar energy, everyone has access, in the world has access to solar. It's just too expensive to convert that to electricity. Uh, and so it's about utility scale about three to four times more than what we get from natural gas combined cycle, which is the cheapest, five cents a kilowatt hour. Okay, it's just three times more expensive. So just like President Kennedy created a moonshot to go to the moon, and return safely within the decade, we have now created a sunshot to reduce the cost of electricity from solar to five cents a kilowatt hour within this decade. And that needs innovation. You cannot do business as usual. And it is not just the module. It is balance of system. It is power electronics <clears throat> and other things. So I can go on and on. But you know, that's the kind of thing that RPE is focusing on, to, to develop a foundation that will create new industries that perhaps does not, do not exist today. Because that's what DARPA did with the internet and everything else. That's the opportunity we have. And as I said, this is our national security, our economic growth and prosperity at stake, and environmental security. Those are the three securities that we have. I guess a quick follow-up. Do you, you know, in a venture capital situation, it's a given that most ideas will not pan out. 
That's, that's part of the deal. Do you feel free to fail in the same way, looking for that, that one innovation that will really make the difference? So this is what we do. I mean, the BEAST program that I talked about, we set technology agnostic targets, OK? So this is double the energy density of today's state-of-the-art lithium-ion battery and one-third the cost. We don't care if it's a banana, <laughs> and that can do it, OK? So these are, you know, as I said, the whole class of lithium-ion batteries. And there's a competition right now. We don't know which one's going to succeed. But if one of them does, this is a new industry that is created that does not exist. I'll talk about another program called Electrofuels that we created. All the fuels that are developed in alternate way, the biofuels that we talk about, are using photosynthesis. Whether it's sugarcane, whether it's cellulose, whether it's corn, whether it's algae, I don't care what you, today all biofuels are photosynthetic biofuels. But that efficiency of converting sunlight to fuels is less than 1%, okay? So which means you'll need a lot of land and water. There's sustainability issues, and we need to go down that, that pathway in order to reduce the cost and make it cost competitive with petroleum-based fuel. What we did in RPE is to create a completely different route of creating biofuels without using photosynthesis. You could do that. You could take electricity from nuclear, electricity from wind or solar, use bugs, which are non-photosynthetic bugs, and there's a lot of biology that's non-photosynthetic. You and I are non-photosynthetic. We are not green. <laughs> so use the bugs to fix carbon dioxide, use the energy from electricity, fix carbon dioxide, make oil. And people thought this is really risky. Really, this is almost impossible. Well, in a year and a half, people are making oil in the labs now at MIT, at NC State, and other places. And that's the kind of opportunity which, of course, electrofuel industry does not exist today. But if we had not invested and taken the risk, and some, you know, many of them will fail, you know, no one else would. This is pre-venture. Mm -hmm. Venture capital wants to see that first prototype before you invest. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Silicon Valley, so I know exactly what, what they're trying to do. This is before that, to create the industry, just like TCP that was created in, in DARPA in 1968. That's when it started. Okay? This, there was no industry of internet at that time, mm -hmm. but that's when it you know, started, and you create the foundation that you create multiple industries out of that. So I think that's where we are. Uh, Brian, I know we talked a little bit before about how NanoSolar is doing right now. It's, it's really, as I said, one of the most innovative PV companies out there. I think you know, you, your, your stuff is sold out for quite a while. You have a better chance of getting a ticket to a Justin Bieber concert than you'd have if you don't already have a reservation <laughs> for one of your products. So give me a sense of where you are now in the market globally, especially, and some of the challenges you still face as you, you know, continue to grow. Sure. NanoSolar uh, is almost 10 years old. and. Uh, like many overnight successes, it's taken that long to get to where we are. Uh, from the perspective of what really the, uh, you know, the early R&D stage was for us, proving out the technology, proving out pilot line processes, proving out the prototype attributes, we were able to access a lot of funding from the federal government, everything from Department of Defense to DARPA funding to National Science Foundation to Department of Energy. So a wide variety of R&D funding mechanisms federally. We had state level support and we were also able to raise about $400 million in, in private equity through four funding rounds. Uh, we strongly believe, and I personally believe, that if a technology is promising, if there's a value proposition and it's potentially scalable, that high quality technology innovation can find funding through ARPA, through DARPA, through other mechanisms. Uh, and many of our sister companies in Silicon Valley have also received funding of various sorts precisely along that pathway. The challenges uh, for growth of a company uh, are the scaling framework. And in particular, it costs hundreds of millions of dollars to build up a factory. Uh, so things like the Department of Energy's Loan Guarantee Program or other mechanisms like that are very helpful. And once you've built that factory and you've got product, you run into a conundrum, which in my view is almost a textbook definition of irony, in that the innovation that excited the early investors, be they the Department of Energy, Defense, or private equity investors, uh, the potential for disruptive growth from that innovation uh, is perceived in a risk-averse commercial banking culture as a source of huge risk. So the very innovation which drives the early investment impedes the later investment. And in that later investment mechanism, how do you get past those issues? Well, 
the more innovative the technology is, whether it's uh, bacteria-driven uh, biofuel production or printed solar uh, photovoltaic cells, uh, it's untested in terms of durability, in terms of the value proposition over the whole value chain in which that product is being played out. Any new product, by definition, has no operating history because it's a new product. So when uh, some, a debt financing entity comes along to do some project with this new technology or this new innovation, one of the things they'll do is go to a third party engineer and say, what's the risk associated with this? So I can figure out what my debt structure should look like. And the company that's got that innovation says, well, it's a new product. There is no 25, 30 year operating history. And the third party engineer says, well, I can't assign a risk. And then the debt financier says, well, I can't assign debt. And so our customers then have a challenge. You know, what do they do in, these, in this situation? They can either wait, uh, which is what many do, wait until the operating history is sufficiently developed that you've got a statistical de-risk for underwriting of any debt financing for downstream projects, or you can go for pure equity projects, which are statistically relatively rare. And in either case, that slows down uh, the manufacturing ramp up because you are waiting or dealing with a, a risk aversion, the collision of two cultures, the R&D risk embracement culture and the commercial banking risk aversion culture collide at the exact scale when a company has a new product with no operating history, when that company is trying to become bankable, and that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about <coughs> debt financing. The other side of the risk, besides the technology, is the balance sheet risk. So you might say, well, I've got a warranty for my product, but the customer might say, well, you are a 10-year-old company and your product warranty is more than twice the duration of your company's history to date. How do I know you'll be around in 20 years? Your balance sheet is such and such, but you know, what is it going to be in five years or 10 years or 20 years? So just the scale of growing companies out of the R&D stage to where you have mitigation of both the technological risk from the risk-averse commercial banking culture for bankability, as well as the um, reduction in risk for balance sheet risk for a company which just isn't at the scale of GE, both of those are really important uh, issues that every company at our scale tackles. Okay. Uh, Tim, GE clearly is already a major uh, player in clean tech, and across the entire really breadth of the clean economy from water to gas to, uh, to wind, now increasingly to solar as well. Uh, give us a little intro into, into all those facets, I guess, of, of GE's role in the clean economy, both nationally but also as a functions in, in metro areas. I know, for instance, sure. out of that report, you play a major role in the fact that Albany, not the, the city that will jump to your mind, actually has more per capita clean economy jobs than anywhere else in the country. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much, Brian. Um, as you say, GE is a, is a long-standing established company. And I think it's important to, to think about some of the aspects that um, GE brings to this discussion because GE, of course, is Thomas Edison's company. So uh, for us, when we talk about innovation, it's truly in the blood. Uh, this, is, this is a company that was built around innovation, always having the, the first products, the best products. Um, we were one of the original companies in the Dow Jones, and we're the only one that is still in the Dow that was in the original Dow. And how do you get there? I really, I think it ties directly back to innovation, because uh, if you don't completely commit yourself to innovation and being dynamic and taking risks to make sure that you're transforming the company and you're not staying tied to what you've done historically just because that's the way you've always done it, you won't, be, it's proven, you can't stay uh, at the top and you can't stay in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So I think that's an important uh, starting point. Now, um, I was quite pleased. I hadn't realized that Albany was um, one, the top cluster when it comes to, to clusters and I do think that that's a really great story because, of course, GE's power and water business is headquartered in Schenectady, New York. That means our wind business in particular is there, the headquarters of the wind business, and we've been adding jobs uh, in that wind business. It's the largest U.S.-owned company in the wind industry, um, the leading supplier of wind turbines in the, in the U.S. market. Um, we also, though, it's very important, we also have in Niskayuna, New York, also in that Albany cluster, it's where our global research center is located. And so we have uh, hundreds of PhDs doing research much in the clean energy area in Niskayuna, New York. And I think that clearly contributes to the fact that 
the Albany area is a, uh, is a leader nationwide. Um, let me just talk about a couple of other metropolitan areas in a way that also highlights the range of, of work that GE does in the clean energy sector. Um, we view, just as President Obama does, we, we view clean energy as everything from solar and wind and other renewables through gas, uh, high efficiency gas turbines and nuclear energy. And um, we are the largest exporter of clean energy um, by that definition, particularly because we export so many gas turbines. Our gas turbines are made in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. We have about 3,100 employees there. We've been increasing employment in Greenville over time. Uh, and we've been investing in these gas turbines to make them constantly more efficient and lower emissions. And our most recent investment is actually entirely based around making those gas turbines work with a renewable energy heavy economy. So in particular, what that means is being able to cycle the gas turbines so that they're able to balance load when you have wind blowing, you, know, you can cycle down. When the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining, you can cycle them up. And it really is a, uh, a very effective way to keep on increasing the percentage of renewables that you can have on the grid. So that's Greenville, uh, it's Schenectady and Greenville. Um, I'll just mention Wilmington, North Carolina. That's where we have our uh, nuclear business headquartered. We have about 1,600 people in Wilmington. And um, that's a very heavily engineering oriented uh, workforce. And we've also been investing in the local community college to help develop the future technicians who can, uh, who can actually fill the jobs that we need to fill because there are a lot of specialized, but you know, not, not master's degree or PhD uh, level engineering types of jobs that you need to fill. Um, one more business to mention is our water business based just outside of Philadelphia, another one of the uh, clean energy hubs. Our water business is, um, is a membrane and chemicals business, but the membrane is, uh, is used for water filtration and can be used for both municipal and for, um, and for industrial applications. So what it comes down to is we've got a really vibrant set of businesses. If, if you add those all up, it's about $21 billion of total revenue from our clean energy businesses. And it's been growing, and we've been investing here in the United States and around the world. Um, I would say that, that not all is rosy, and we have to recognize that the clean energy business does depend, just as actually the entire energy business depends fundamentally on government policy. Um, it always has. It's a heavily regulated, heavily regulated business. And, um, and the fact is that the current impasse here in Washington is raising issues. And um, one very clear example <coughs> of that would be for our wind business where the production tax credit for wind is scheduled to expire at the end of next year. And you already see that there, are, there has been a decline in the uh, rate of installation of new wind projects here in the United States, especially here in the first quarter of uh, 2011, it's dropped. So we've got to watch that closely. It's a, it's a real challenge. And um, I think the solar industry could have a similar challenge as uh, tax credits expire there, uh, electric, char electric vehicle charging stations, it goes on and on. Um, so careful work has to be done. Um, I know Bruce spoke about the value of a clean energy standard. Perhaps in the next round we can come back to that. But there's a lot of policy aspects that need to be addressed. Just as a quick follow-up, I mean, you know, we, we, we have this, this feeling, I think, the U.S. is behind when it comes to getting that investment to deploying that clean tech. Is that, is that, is that the way it looks from where you're standing as well? Um, well, where I'm, where I'm sitting, I think we are, the U.S. is, in very good shape right now in terms of our innovative capability. So I think a lot of the ideas are there. When, when we've done uh, outreach to take in good ideas in the clean energy space, we get a lot of great ideas from US innovators. Um, the biggest challenge is whether you're gonna have the long-term long certainty about the market being there uh, to convert that into investment here in the United States. And that's really important because we have the opportunity to be an export powerhouse in clean energy. But if we don't have a domestic market, you won't be an export powerhouse either. So it actually all really ties together. You will have the growth in China. You will have the growth in Europe in these clean energy areas. But will the US be positioned to take a major part of that? Mm -hmm. Jim, what's, uh, what's Lazard doing in this field really to, to help play a role in, in creating and, and scaling up these, these kind of tech firms that we're talking about? Um, Thanks, Brian. And uh, 
the help is an unusual word to use around banking. But I, uh, uh, we actually sit in a very. Uh, um, it's out of the goodness of your heart, I know. Yes. <laughs> I guess we're the ones who are we're, um, sort of commercially incentivized to actually go out and find the bankable ideas. And, and so as a result, we sit in a very interesting nexus point where our job is to go out and, and scour the country um, looking for the innovative companies, which we think we can match up with the, the capital that's uh, available, both in the primarily in the private sector, but when we, we can develop good um, public financing ideas, we, we work on those as, as well. Um, and I think I, I, many of the things that we're seeing, um, and this is uh, you know, our, my full-time job is, is really focused on the U.S., on growth companies. Um, we see a lot of the challenges that the panel is, is echoing, and you know, we could rapidly you know, fire them off. It's the, you know, is there really going to be adoption of these technologies? Um, Brian, you sounded like my underwriting committee that we often have to face when explaining why we, we're, we're covering the companies, um, the capital required to scale. And it's not just that initial capital to go from being a pilot program to having your first commercial facility. It's really going from that first commercial facility up to your, you know, your 10 projects as your, as your sales build. Um, and the market is changing every year. And it's rapidly becoming a, a global market. We've cited China. You can talk about India, Eastern Europe, uh, South Africa, North Africa. It's a rapidly globalizing industry, and in many ways, it's very disruptive to the young companies who are trying to play into what they thought was Europe for, for a while and the, and the subsidized regime there. And they're finding they can no longer just go to a Munich beer hall and sell a lot of solar panels. <laughs> they now have to get malaria shots and, and go to places they'd never heard of because you know, these people are putting solar panels in their neighborhoods. And, uh, and so it's a very different market. So globalization is having a big uh, impact and there's one theme we didn't speak about on the challenge side, which is that um, you know this <coughs> isn't social networking. For, you know this isn't right. Twitter. This is you. You uh, young companies are up against large incumbents. So a biofuel company is competing against Exxon. Mm -hmm. A solar yeah. company is competing against. G I mean there you know, we all there's a, the incumbency issue is a big theme for us, and it often leads I think to alternative energy companies thinking about strategic partners a lot earlier than other innovative technologies. On the positive side, um, what, what we find very encouraging is the innovation theme in the U.S. I think there's a great deal of innovation taking place in the U.S. right now. But also we're moving into a greater installed base. So you're now seeing, seeing a, a wind market in the United States that has close to 45 gigawatts installed. You have a solar base that's rapidly growing, and you have a global installed base. And so what that means is that we're learning things about these products, and we're also developing ancillary industries, service industries around those businesses. Mm -hmm. We're finding that in wind that actually um, domestic companies do quite well because the components are large and need to be manufactured um, locally. In fuels, we're way beyond ethanol. We're into the sunlight-less you know, biofuels now. So we're moving into the second and third generation of, of products. And as a result, as these businesses scale and new technologies are developed, cost is coming down. So I think we're sort of short term, given what's going on in, in Europe, given what's going on in the lack of clarity coming out of Washington, as an alternative energy banker, we're sort of short term neurotic. <laughs> but we're, we're long term <laughs> bullish about the industry. And I think, though, that the unique challenge is, because this isn't social networking and you need large amounts of capital, is that it's critical that there are policies in support of these industries to help bring them from those very early stages through. Because as Arun said, it's, you know, it's one in 100 at the angel stage or his stage, and then it's a one in 10 shot at the VC stage. You know, it's got to be a one to one shot five to 10 years later for this industry to survive. And, um, you know, we could talk about, the, and so the final point I would make is that the diversification of the industry. It's no longer uh, it's solar and wind and, and biofuels. It's, um, we're find, finding very innovative things taking place in the United States around recycling, taking dirty plastic and turning it into, you know, crude at $40 a barrel, taking, you know, wet garbage, doing industrial scale composting in places like Boston and Vancouver which are really quite exciting developments. And a lot of these guys are technology agnostic and they're process smart. And I think we're gonna have a future of alternative energy companies who are quite good around engineering and process. And that's gonna help uh, 
I think, sort of take the United States to the, the next level, and it's an area where we play quite well. I want to go back to you. Um, the, uh, Bill Gates and his other heavyweights, the American Energy Innovation Council, I mean, they're, they're suggesting that we spend billions more on, on R&D when it comes to uh, that side of things. As you point out, you know, we are pretty good at the idea side, but how could we get better? I mean, if you, you know, what are your, you know, your real wish list for, for improving that innovation system when it comes to energy for America? I think I agree with everything that has been said. I mean, it, from where we are in ARPA-E, um, that has to go to the next stage of the first in a class plant. And that is, as you were pointing out, it is very difficult to get financing uh, because this is not you know, going to be paying off in two years or three years like software does. This is going to be longer term, and access to low-cost capital is absolutely key uh, because if you do not have that, you're not going to have the first-of-a-kind plant out here, and that's going to be cherry-picked by other nations as is going on. And once you have sunken costs somewhere else, um, and if that region has demand, as was pointed out, uh, the, the next stage of you know, commercial or pre-commercial plant will be there as well. And we have just lost the access to that technology. And once you have the first of a class uh, in a manufacturing plant going somewhere else, you will likely see R&D going mm -hmm. there as well. And that's sort of a bread and butter. So there's a chain effect that could happen. And it's really important to use, as was said, to use the local demand out here to create some demand for clean energy so that some of it stays out here, actually a lot of it stays out here, but also providing the, the, so the access to low-cost capital to be able to keep the in-between manufacturing out here. So that you really need to look at it as a system. And while RPEs are the really you know, upstream, you got to look at the whole stream and keep and make sure that we create the local demand as well as the financing out here. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a quick follow-up, are we, I mean, unless there's some kind of pull policy, some kind of guarantee of demand, is, are we going to keep hitting this problem again? You know, we talked about some of the policy choices out of the, uh, the report about a, a clean energy standard. I mean, is that a, a must, really, if, if this is going to break through? Well, I think you have, you know, things like renewable portfolio standards, I think 29 states, someone can correct me if I'm wrong, um, and varying kinds. That's right. Um, and so that's, that's, that's a demand pull. But as I said uh, before, I think I said this, that many of the assets on the grid, for example, are two years beyond the lifetime. Mm -hmm. And at some point, there's a, there's a vulnerability out there that utilities and ISOs and all will have to address that. And the question is, could we use that demand pull that is likely to come to create those technologies that are not only will be deployed out here, but deployed elsewhere in the world? Because the grid is growing more as faster than other parts of the world than out here. But we could use our demand to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's the opportunity I think we should make available. Some of it is creating RPS and hopefully some clean energy standards. But uh, some of it is just hitting asset walls. Mm -hmm. And it's the reliability of the grid, et cetera, that we could rely on. Brian, you really, I think, diagnosed the, the financial troubles that, that face a company like yours when you're trying to, to scale up. So what kind of help do you need? I mean, you again, sort of, if you had the power to make that happen, what would you, what would you, what kind of system would you craft? I would balance demand and supply side incentives. The demand side, RPS, clean energy standards are all critical, but in the absence of supply side incentives, you can view the demand side of the United States as an enormous economic stimulus package for Beijing. Uh, so if we don't want the U.S. taxpayers to demand products that can't be produced in the U.S. because there's no manufacturing base, we better start supporting the manufacturing base in the U.S. and grow the American manufacturing economy as well. Some very pragmatic things that we can do. Uh, one example would be product warranty insurance for new products. These products that have no operating history, uh, the reason that the underwriting of the warranties and insurance products for warranties is so very difficult is precisely because of that lack of operating history coupled to a less than enormous balance sheet because you haven't grown to that scale yet. But the federal government, arguably, may have that balance sheet. Uh, so could we have a federal backstop of warranty insurance for new products? And it would, it would look like this. You talk to the insurance industry. You figure out statistically in a particular technology thread how much data they need to be able to underwrite a particular financial product to support the growth of that product and the 
companies that produce their product. And you backstop the warranty during the period in which that data is being collected. At the end of that time period, you hand it off to private industry. So it's a public-private partnership. In solar, that might look like three or four years of support federally to backstop a 25-year warranty. But at year three or four, it's now in the hands of private insurance industry who are soothed by the mathematics and statistics of the data from years zero, one, and two. So very, very low cost way to go. Uh, we've done a number of modeling exercises and found that uh, the return on investment is anywhere from four to 10x. So this pays itself off on an annual basis in a few months. So in an era where we're trying to be fiscally prudent and financially conservative, this kind of policy uh, would be really helpful to kickstart the industry. A perfect place for that would be in a green bank. Uh, the ex and folks have asked, you know, is there any federal precedent for this? Yes, there's the crop insurance mm -hmm. uh, that the Department of Agriculture has put out. There's the credit subsidy risk insurance the XM Bank has put out. Uh, there's, a, there's a number of federal programs that have shown effectiveness and return on investment arguments, which we could learn from and develop for the clean uh, energy economy in a way that really would stimulate manufacturing growth in the U.S. The other thing we could do is slightly tune federal policy in ways that make enormous differences for smaller companies, but barely impact the federal financing. And what do I mean by that? Well, you may all have heard about this 48C tax credit uh, about a year ago, almost a year and a few months. And there was a lot of you know, self-congratulations by folks, some of whom are in this room, that this was a fantastic policy because the metric for success was defined as oversubscription. It was 3x oversubscribed, so therefore it was successful. Well, if you travel out to Silicon Valley and you talk to the companies that received those 48C tax credits, no one has been able to monetize a single penny. So why is that? Two reasons. First of all, any company that's building up factory one, as Arun's pointed out, or factory N, is spending hundreds of millions of dollars to do so. And you've got so much net operating loss accrued that the ability to use that tax credit directly is several years downstream. The other way to monetize it is to sell it to a third party. Selling it to a third party you know, has some arcane tax structure, which we needn't get into in this forum. But the critical aspect that uh, was not properly addressed uh, by Congress was uh, the five-year credit recapture period. And that single term has killed the monetization of the tax credits by any company that's at a scale that really needs them. Because we go to a third party and say, we would like to sell you this tax credit. And the third party will say, well, how do I know you're going to be around in five years as a partner? If, the, if you go away in year 4.99999, the tax credit goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So the only way I can do the deal with you is if you give me a letter of credit for the full value of the tax credit. <laughs> well, that doesn't quite work, because not only <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, if, if the, if the five-year credit capture period was waived for companies under a certain scale as measured by production output, as measured by revenues, whatever the right metric might be, that would enormously enable already allocated funds in a way that can actually stimulate the economy now. At a, at a more meta level, no one talked to any of us in Silicon Valley about this tax credit before it was structured. So it was a very, very well thought out application process, really looked at greenhouse gas emission abatement, uh, life cycle analysis, you know, financial growth. It, it was very comprehensive, but it didn't address the operating needs of small companies that actually would use it. So a takeaway message is talk to us. <laughs> <laughs> He's right here, Tim. Uh, Tim, I know you have some thoughts on, on this as well in terms of what, you know, what sort of policy gaps and whether it's green banks, things like that that can hopefully solve some of these sure. problems. Well, first of all, um, I think, I really think Brian's point is a very good one about looking at both supply side efficiency and demand side efficiency. Um, there's, they're both important. Um, and I would add a third part because it sometimes literally slips through the cracks, but that is when we think about the overall energy system, transmission, transmission and distribution efficiency. It's an area um, that we as a company have invested a lot in through our smart grid business, our digital energy business. Um, and we're investing a lot in the software to manage grids that will help make it more efficient. So I think if we think about supply side, demand side, and delivery uh, efficiency, and we really look, look at the entire package, and we should 
not just incentivize the demand side, but incentivize the entire system. Um, that's one point. A couple of specific things. Um, we, uh, Bruce talked a little bit about the, uh, the recommendation for a clean energy standard. Uh, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee has been looking at that idea, has actually solicited public comments on it, and um, so far has not moved toward legislation. But that's one idea, one way that you would actually be able to put forward a, um, a national policy that would actually create the certainty that we've all talked about, the long-term commitment and certainty that we've all talked about. It's not necessarily the only way to go, but it is one of the only ideas that's out there that has been clearly defined or has been somewhat defined and which uh, could provide that basis. So I think that's, that's an element that's really important. Um, tax credits, uh, obviously we're in a time where everything that uh, scores negatively from a budget sense is under intense scrutiny. Um, but I do think that a lot of these renewable tax credits create w way more in terms of total tax revenues than they cost. They probably actually don't really cost anything. And, um, and they need to be looked at closely because the negative implications of allowing them to expire without some equally efficient and effective alternative are, are devastating to everything we're talking about here. And then the last couple of things I want to mention because the report also does talk about the export opportunities and the fact that building a strong U.S. economy can help us in the, in the clean energy area, can help, help us become an export superpower. There is legislation on the Hill right now to um, renew uh, XM Bank. That actually is extremely important and hasn't really, so far, you know, our clean energy industry hasn't gotten mm -hmm. strong enough to do a lot of exporting, but the potential is certainly there. And without an XM Bank, we're facing competition from other countries that do have export <coughs> credit agencies, and it would be very difficult. And then, as a general matter, I think as there's a lot that can be done with new free trade agreements. There's uh, three free trade agreements that are now on the Hill for approval. All of them actually have good clean energy language in there. It's kind of sprinkled throughout, but they're, they're all actually uh, pro-environmental in many ways. And new negotiations are going on, for instance, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And there's a real effort to look at environmental trade issues in that context. So uh, I think we need to be doing that. Even as we look at our domestic policies, we also need to be looking at how we create the uh, right international environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jim, maybe you could pick up on some of that too. He mentioned uh, the XM Bank. Uh, what kind of role that can play in, in getting some of the financing going? Yeah, no, no, I'm glad we, we brought the theme back to yeah. export, which is what Bruce began with. Because I, that's that's what we see, I guess, in the in the banking world. We see the U.S. domestic market is really quite nascent, but a, a global opportunity that is that is massive, and in some ways a lot more mature and forward thinking in their policies. And the Exim Bank in particular, I think you're, you're right, it's because the, the, the domestic base here has been smaller for export, but it is growing. I think if you look at the, the amount of Exim loans, Exim Bank loans that we've seen over the last three years, it's probably doubled mm -hmm. each year in the past couple of years, and it's likely to double again in terms of their commitment of capital. It's a relatively small overall asset base. But I can give you multiple examples where um, $10 million here in a loan guarantee, $20 million there, $50 million really provided some of that bridge capital, not, not so much at the early stage, but at that second stage of going from commercial plant one up to the, the next level, or at least providing some bridge capital as the, uh, the technology has improved. So I think the, the Exim Bank is, is a really nice model for how that, how that can be done. I also think that we have to do a better job unleashing the private capital. A tremendous amount of money has been raised in infrastructure funds looking for either high single digit or low double digit returns. And, and, and I, I, don't, I don't think we want to get into, into a debate on the arcane tax policies that have encouraged tax equity to be the financing source for large um, uh, wind and solar um, utility scale plants. But there's something that doesn't seem intuitively right when you're just sort of selling the investment to someone who has a, you know, a, who's getting a tax benefit and maybe completely unrelated to the industry or doesn't have an expertise versus actually incentivizing infrastructure funds who want to be long-term 25, 30-year-old energy, 30-year energy owners. And um, so I think there's, there's work to be done on how we harness the private infra infrastructure capital. And I think there's also costless ways of thinking about our export policy. Many of the alternative energy companies have management teams, and Brian, you can speak to this, who are under a lot of stress just raising capital for their build-outs. For them to have to travel to, you know, 
to you know, South Africa one week, Bangladesh the next. They, they don't have the global sales channels of a, of a Schneider's or a Siemens or a GE's. And what we're finding increasingly as we move into this mature or second stage of alternative energy, that um, not only do they have capital problems, they simply have management problems and resources problems to reach global markets. And I don't know how, I think there may be a policy solution there where you can help channel how people are connecting with these markets, but these are not traditional connections. It's, you know, one, it's, it's selling bio, you know, mass to the UK. It's selling, as I said, solar um, process skills to uh, South Africa. And there, there are new channels being built, mm -hmm. and, the, uh, we're, and the, the new markets are really those where uh, people haven't thought of because, uh, you know, solar is great in great insulation areas. Mm -hmm. And it's not about just where your labor population is. It's where the sun shines best. Uh, <laughs> wind is in places like the upper Midwest and parts of the world we never thought of. There's tremendous opportunities in Chile where it rains, you know, one week a decade, but they have massive mining operations that uh, where you know you can sell, you know, uh, renewable energy at 10 or 11 cents a kilowatt hour without subsidy. And there's, and so it, it really takes a different mindset in thinking about what are the new global sales channels that have been created by these new industries, because the uh, the sourcing of the feedstock is different mm -hmm. than we've dealt with before. And I think. Government and, and policy support can play a uh, play a role, and, and certainly, um, and I'll go back to the incumbency theme, which which I don't think people emphasize enough is that if you're going to support electric vehicles or natural gas vehicles, you know there's a big chicken and egg problem. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think about whether a single policy statement should be on the table that really you know requires or mandates some usage because. When you have you know 100,000 filling stations, they're not going to go to EVs or NGVs in you know one year or five <laughs> years, not even 10 years. It's a big commitment, right? Um, and so I, I think the uh, the incumbency issue needs to to get more attention. We have some time to take some questions from the audience. If you can identify yourself and uh, if you direct it towards certain panelists, let us know as well. I guess right there first. My name is Martin Apple. I'm uh, president of the Council of Scientific Society Presidents. I think the future of the country depends on our ability to nurture and capture creativity. And I think as I look across this spectrum from embracing risk to being risk averse as we keep moving down the line here, I'm wondering about the future and how do we get capital built again the way venture capital originally was in which entrepreneurs who had made money started investing it in other entrepreneurs who were trying to start companies, and that was the seed money that built. What we have now in venture capital is mezzanine financing in which they skip the seed stage because they're risk adverse. And as we're in a down economy, they're even more risk adverse. So what incentives can you see that would rebuild the seed capital for the beginning entrepreneurs, the creative people who we need to nurture? Sure. So when Nanosolar was started, our first 10 uh, angel investments came from 10 successful entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley who all put in small amounts of money. This was in the nuclear winter of funding back in you know, late 2001, early 2002. So it was a big deal to pull out a checkbook and sign it for any value other than zero. And uh, for them to do that, I think it speaks to your point, which is well taken, that uh, entrepreneurs have to help other entrepreneurs from an angel funding perspective. I do think in the valley that exists, uh, it, much less so in the rest of the US. Uh, and I think uh, connecting people from one innovation region to another and uh, uh, really emulating best practices is the way to do that. So folks who might be in the you know, research triangle in North Carolina need to see culturally how entrepreneurs help each other at the early angel stage. Also, there is a set of venture capital funds which specialize in early stage investments, uh, and they do a superb job at vetting those companies for the kind of risk profiles they're willing to do. But many VCs, as you say, don't specialize in that era. So um, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs think of venture capital as a monolithic block, but it's actually a portfolio of risks 
uh, risk profiles as well. And some venture capital firms have in their mission statement to accept a certain level of risk for a certain expected return, and others are different. And so you need to target, we as entrepreneur, entrepreneurs need to target our pitches at the early stages to the venture firms that can embrace that level of risk and have done so historically well. We have a Twitter town hall question. Yes, we have a question <laughs> so from well Twitter present. from Taryn Norris from Americans for Energy Leadership. He's wondering, what's America's comparative advantage over China in the clean economy? Anyone want to grab that? <laughs> is there one? Well, <laughs> there, yeah, there is. There's several. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, yeah. Uh, uh, Maybe. Oh, sorry. He's, he's here, apparently. Yeah, about how we need to create domestic markets. Well, Go ahead. Let me, I'll, I'll take a stab at it and let Jim say some words, too. Um, I think, first of all, the U.S., um, we've just already talked about innovation. So I think you need to start with innovation as the area where the U.S. has uh, tremendous capability. And, um, but I wouldn't finish there. Um, manufacturing, we do not need to accept that we are not capable of being competitive in manufacturing. In fact, um, GE, I mean, just looking at our own company, we have actually been investing in additional manufacturing in the United States. We've added about 15,000 U.S. jobs in, manu uh, 15,000 U.S. jobs, 6,800 of them have been in manufacturing in the last uh, 10 years or so. So we're continuing to invest here, and we see the newest U.S. manufacturing as quite competitive globally, or we wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't competitive globally. So I don't think that we should assume that um, that the U.S. can't be competitive. Uh, and, I, and our whole previous conversation does lead back to the things that have to be done to be competitive in the clean energy area. Um, but innovating and adopting best manufacturing practices are the two things that we know we can do if we have the markets. Yeah, I, I, it, it, it's innovate. The level of innovation that takes place in the United States is, is just, is simply, it, it's just, it's multiple times what, what we see um, elsewhere. Um, the engineering and process skills here, um, which I think are increasingly in, important. And also, we don't, we don't look at all manufacturing as just a lump. I mean, there, there's, there's some manufacturing, certainly, which lower end, commoditized, very, it's cost, it's very, it adds very little value to the overall chain. What we're focused on are the more complex elements of the supply chain, where really technology innovation, education um, is quite important. And also, the, the, you have to think about the pools of capital that are formed in the US. You know, th there are venture capitalists who have been burned in, in alternative energy, but it is a very sophisticated venture capital community. Um, there's also um, a, a large network of, we call sort of family offices, high net worth groups, which have really, uh, who are very focused and are looking for differentiated strategies that we have found quite supportive of alternative energy. I, I see the, um, the, the Chinese, for now, are, are really pretty heavily reliant still on um, direct government loans and provincial support. They have massive hurdles of their own. Um, the jury is still out in terms of their own efficient allocation and whether they need 80 turbine manufacturers when the rest of the world has decided we really only need about 10, um, and whether we need hundreds of solar panel manufacturers, whether we need polysilicon coming out of every single town I mean, just there are. I would not. I think. The, I think there. Uh, the, we are in the first inning of the the green economy, That's and I right. think, um, at least from my my standpoint, uh, is that I rarely go to China anymore. It's really just traveling around the country to the various centers, and uh, and trying to identify those bankable ideas to help, as we said at the beginning. Brent. Sure. I, I would say. I mean, the the question was about competitive advantage with China. Number one. I'm a recovering professor, <laughs> spent a lot of years at Berkeley. I would say our system of higher education, the university system, the national lab system, we have the, the head of Oak Ridge National Lab right out here. That is a very, very unique thing. And that is, number one, our competitive advantage. We should not, never, never uh, underestimate the power of that human capital that we create out here. The United States has always, always in its history, have been able to attract the best talent from around the world. 
and we should continue. I'm a beneficiary of that. We should continue to do that. Other nations are not like that. And we have always attracted talent out here and, and unleashed them in this ecosystem of higher education and national labs, et cetera. We have to do that. We, keep, we have to continue doing attracting talent because there'll be a talent competition at some point. We will never be able to compete with China in terms of number of people. <laughs> I think that's fair to say. <laughs> we should be able to compete with them in the number of good ideas. And from my vantage point, I get to see some of the best ideas around the country. I can tell you, I am extremely optimistic about the ideas that are coming out from a university, startup companies, national labs, et cetera. This is amazing stuff. And we sort of beat ourselves a little bit. Oh, we, we're getting, you know, we're not. No. This is, we are the best right now. Now, if you look at the China five, Chinese five-year plan, you'll find that they are looking at our playbook and said, we need to figure, f focus on innovation. Great. That's great. That's a little bit of competition. Wonderful. And what we should be doing is looking at their market and seeing how do we take this, you know, this innovation ecosystem out there, out here, unleash that with manufacturing and all, and look at the global market and our local market. So that's the kind of thing that we need to plan out. And if we play our books, play our game right, use our own playbook in the right way, we can compete. Pranjip, go ahead. Innovation uh, is often defined by many of us as the technologies that drive new product creation. But another way America can stay competitive with China and other countries is to have innovation be a, a central feature of the manufacturing environment. In other words, in China or other countries, how do you compete with a US product? You do it at lower cost with manual labor. Manual labor often leads to lower quality products, throwaway products, and so forth, which are ultimately not very green and <coughs> they're being uh, used for very short periods of time. So their, their embedded cost is actually much higher than what they're actually sold for. So having high production volume, <coughs> low cost but high quality innovative manufacturing technologies is another way to compete. And at the federal level, if we encourage that, that's very important. There was a program um, in the DOD called Mantech at one point, Manufacturing Technology Program, that, that <coughs> spoke to that. And uh, the DOD today is a very uh, strong advocate of that. In fact, I would encourage whoever in, isn't from that Michigan entrepreneurial company doing foundry, clean foundry development to talk to the DOD uh, and see what you could do for them. I think that'd be a really important funding source. I'm happy to speak with you as well. Uh, but the, the folks uh, that are thinking about innovation purely at the technology level, uh, I think if we can expand that definition to embrace manufacturing, we can stay competitive globally using that same entrepreneurial spirit, using the national labs, using the academic institutions, and really penetrate the cost structure that lets us stay globally competitive on a sustained basis. We're running a bit behind, so we have time for one more question. Right, I guess the gentleman. front. I'm Sandy Apgar from Baltimore. About the built environment, and specifically uh, ARPA-E, if I have that right, uh, and as an alumnus of DOD, um, is there a priority, a project, a program for the built environment, and particularly for the process of producing and managing the built environment? We have a huge sector of the economy, roughly 20%, but highly inefficient because of history and policy and structure. And uh, I never thought, frankly, until this morning that a center of excellence of innovation intellectually in your unit could do for that aspect of the built environment what actually DOD and others have done uh, in other respects and uh, produce enormous breakthroughs if you could focus on or would on process, not just products? Well, let me wear my bigger hat than just RPE hat as representing the Department of Energy. I should say, before I even say that, um, that before I came to the DOE, I, in fact, testified in front of the Senate on exactly this particular issue on buildings and how to reduce energy consumption in buildings and the built environment as a whole. The Department of Energy has, if you look at the there's a buildings program um, that has invested significantly in the R&D, but not just R&D in the demonstration, getting the financing, et cetera, the Better Buildings Initiative. There is, a, it, as, as you know, it is a very fragmented industry um, in, for the built environment. You needed some, uh, uh, the ability, this is where the federal government can be a convener in many ways 
Uh, there's a buildings energy innovation hub that is there in Pennsylvania, but it's actually nationwide, but it's based in the Navy Yard in Philadelphia. If you ever get a chance, go there and see what, what's going on. Um, and you need, you have a microgrid out there, the buildings, et cetera. Uh, so there's a lot of activity going on in this area, and it is an area where, and it uses 75% of the electricity. So we, we have to make it much more efficient. Um, in the RPE side, we looked at what the rest of the DOE is doing and say, where is the white space, if you may, that the RPE could focus on? And that's a partnership between RPE and the rest of DOE. And we focused on, you know, so we saw lighting program already there that has been covered by the rest of the Department of Energy. We focused on HVAC uh, because that is, you know, 40, heating and cooling is about 40, 50% of the building uh, energy consumption. And we found that we are a factor of 10 away from the theoretical limit in air conditioning. And I know we have been using air conditioning since Carrier, 1928. But we said that instead of making incremental improvement in the compressor or the desiccant and things like that, let's take a quantum leap and put the target as the, in a factor of 10. Let's put a factor somewhere in between. And we call, call that program Beat It. <laughs> Building energy efficiency through integrated thermal devices. <laughs> so beat the target. And what you get is, you know, you, you get scientists and engineers excited so here's a challenge, here's some money, go for it. And you find innovation then. Competition is a good thing in that respect. And we're finding amazing innovation of you know, rem removing humidity from the air and then cooling it so that you don't have the latent heat load. I won't go into the technical details. But to fair to say, amazing innovation coming out to reduce the energy consumption, to reduce the greenhouse effect of hydrofluorocarbons. This is a huge effect, about 2,000 times more than CO2, the, the uh, refrigerants. And at cost, the cost is very important. So there's a lot of, so stay tuned in that one. I'll give you more updates if you want. Okay. Well, I think we learned one thing in this panel is that RPE is great at coming up with acronyms. <laughs> <laughs> That's the Friday evening happy hour. <laughs> okay. uh, I want to thank the panel for, for really a very valuable and excellent conversation. <laughs> and uh, our next. Our next panel discussion is going to be uh, looking at the clean economy by regions, and it's going to be led by Mark Miro, who's a Brookings Senior Fellow and Policy Director at the Metropolitan Policy Program, who really helped put together the research for, for this paper. Uh, so I'll leave it to him. <laughs>